Well, we've all seen the news. Shipping containers are piled up in the ports of Los Angeles, Savannah, and elsewhere. Qualified truck drivers are in short supply. Storms destroying warehouses or flooding roads. The White House asking for 24-hour operations at ports and promising funds to expand capacity. This is truly a topic that needs no introduction because anyone who isn't living off the grid as a subsistence farmer can tell you their personal story of what they wanted or needed and could not get delivered on time. Hello and welcome to Global Sourcing Insights from SIPS. I'm Bob Rossback and this edition is a co-production of SIPS Americas and the Michigan State University Broad College of Business. Our guests today are Nick Little, Little is Director, Railway Education in the Center for Railway Research and Education at the Broad College of Business at Michigan State. So there's no guesswork here about his area of expertise. He's worked for or researched railways in both the United Kingdom and the United States, but none have traveled directly between them. I guess that's why we have container ships. Nick? Hello, Bob. Thank you very much for that introduction. Our second guest is Jason Miller, Associate Professor in the Broad College of Business, and Miller's expertise is the for hire truck transportation industry, including productivity, price dynamics, and driver turnover. His second interest is also macroeconomic research with a special emphasis on the disruptive role of imports, tariffs, and of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. Welcome, Jason. Hello, thanks for having us. <laughs> And of course, our my co-host and partner, Bill Michaels, VP of Operations at SIPS Americas. Hello, Bill. How are you? I'm great, Bob. Happy to be here. So we all have our horror stories of what didn't arrive when it was supposed to and what a headache or heartbreak that caused. And we've all heard news reports citing every cause imaginable for the delays. So we know things are bad. But how bad are they? Do we have any numbers that are telling us the trouble we're in? And what are the pain points in trucking? Where are the pain points in railways? So, Jason, why don't you begin? What are the what are the numbers tell you? So when, when I look at the numbers right now, I actually tend to take sort of an optimistic view about things and that we've had essentially record consumer demand since about June of 2020 brought on by not only stimulus money, but the fact that folks couldn't spend money on services, so they've plowed money into goods. And that was really supercharged then this last March. And so what we've seen is record imports. Imports are about 15, 15 to 20% higher, give or take which metric you use relative, so far in 2021 relative to 2019. And so when you take a look at to me, it's a demand side right now is that we've had a system that's been straining under demand. And the fact it's actually held up as well as it has is, to me, the story that really hasn't been presented as much. That's, that is not, that's not the, what you hear from, uh, from people who are trying to get things in and out and around on trucks. So that's kind of a surprising analysis. Yeah, I've, I've got a bit of a contrarian view in that regard, but that's because, again, I'm a macroeconomist looking at overall levels of demand. And what I'm seeing, you know, especially the import supply chain side, the fact that we've been processing more imports through this year than we ever have, both air imports and containerized imports. That is the story that has not received the coverage it has. And when you have this prolonged demand, it puts systems under tremendous strain. And then you're combining this with some very severe weather disruptions. I mean, the February 2021 polar vortex is the most disruptive weather event going back to the blizzard of 1978. Practically um, for a week, it shut down the two major Western railroads, which causes huge disruptions. It shifts more volume over to truck. Um, you know, you have now in Canada with the flooding in British Columbia has severely affected Canadian National, Canadian Pacific. And so you, you're just combining all of these things one on top of the other. But the fact is, at the end of the day, there's still product, essential products at the supermarket. We don't have widespread shortages of gasoline. And so to me, the really catastrophic things are more, well, I can't get an appliance in a week like I used to. It now may take a month. To me, at the end of the day, while that's bad, that's not catastrophically bad. 
Um, and so to me, I look now, are we better off than we were in March of 2020 when it comes to the consumer product side? My answer is yes, we don't have fair supermarkets. Excellent. Hey, Jason, I have a question. Has the fact that a lot of people are, are now using e-commerce and where we used to take whole truckloads to distribution centers, we're now taking individual packages to uh, consumers. Has that really made any, any, any difference? Where, where that's really affected things is we've seen this explosion of employment in both the warehousing sector and especially the parcel sector. For a lot of industrial shippers who rely on parcel operations, what that's actually done is it's made this October, November, December period even worse when it comes to getting service. Though actually, if we look so far this holiday season, UPS and FedEx are doing much better than they were last year. And so if anything, it seems that things are actually better this year on the consumer side for holiday deliveries uh, for items bought online than we were last year. And that's really just because demand this year is not this massive 20 or 30 percent jump higher than it was last year. Interesting. So what are the pain points in railways, Nick? It's very interesting, actually, because what Jason has noticed in trucking is a little bit the same as what happened on the railways. We actually got to capacity on international intermodal, uh, particularly from the West Coast. And um, that actually uh, kept us working. You know, the, the numbers are very good. They're as high as they've ever been in terms of traffic, number of containers, number of shipments. Um, the difficulty comes that there are bottlenecks further down the supply chain. So what happened, uh, in my view, is that the pattern of demand, as Jason has pointed out, changed. But even the pattern of purchases of items changed. People started wanting to get things that they could use straight away at home, things like garden furniture, hot tubs, things like that. And getting those through the warehouse system proved to be quite difficult. Um, there were warehouses that were full of goods that hadn't been sold in early 2020, and they didn't have anywhere to put these new deliveries, which were coming in quickly from the Far East. So what do you do? You actually get your container, you get it on the chassis, delivered to the warehouse, it sits in the yard for longer than it should do, waiting to be unloaded and put in the warehouse. That then causes a shortage of those chassis and means that containers have built up in the inland terminals on the railway, places like Chicago, Memphis, those sort of places, couldn't get chassis moved, couldn't get containers moved, so you had a big buildup of containers. Where do you put the next load of containers that's arriving on the trains? You can't unload them. You keep them on the trains. You fill up your yard, nowhere to put the next train coming in. So the next train waits 30, 40 miles west of Chicago, say, and then that backlogs until every possible siding between Chicago and Los Angeles is blocked. And then you get a capacity problem. And that's what's actually happened. And uh, the ports were then feeling the crunch. Where do they put containers when they take them off the ship? And uh, that's where moving drayage from the ports to temporary container terminals, uh, particularly on the West Coast, has been uh, a way to try and save them the ports becoming even more gridlocked than they were. So it's a classic supply chain situation going back from the customer and the consumer right back through all the individual steps of the distribution chain to find that, okay, now we've got a problem at the ports, but hang on, what about the other side of the Pacific Ocean? What's happening there? Well, they're not getting a supply of empty containers back like they used to because the shipping companies, if you're waiting outside a port for 20, 30 days to unload, as soon as you get your berth, you want to unload and get out of there. You don't want to waste time loading empty containers that don't have the same revenue. You want to get back and get more full containers. So that's been a problem. It's also hurt our exports as a country. We haven't been able to get containers of grain out of the country. So there is a lot of grain traffic with the railways move to the ports has also been delayed as well. But, okay, let's go back a second here. 
You're saying that, you know, we've heard so much about the ports being stacked up, but you're saying that it's the same situation in rail yards, uh, in major rail uh, gateways or, 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 or hubs around the United States. Like what you said, Memphis was one and Memphis, there, Memphis, Memphis one, Chicago. Chicago. They're the two main ones that have been backed up. But um, if you look at traffic coming into the East Coast, uh, a lot more of that goes by road because it's shorter haul distance. Uh, so they haven't had quite the same backlog problem there because they can clear the road traffic much faster. Okay, so the so the trucks, the the freight going by truck on the east coast because of the shorter hauls is not hasn't been in the same kind of situation as the long hauls. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah, I think, uh, wasn't it in July, Union Pacific suspended service from the West Coast into Chicago because its intermodal terminal was backed both up? So this and, that was one example of the cascading effects. Yeah, both Union Pacific and BNSF did that as well. Um, so they, they regulated the speed of traffic coming into Chicago by using pricing mechanisms and... Uh, actually curtailed the number of trains that were set out, setting off from the West Coast. So how does all this intersect or collide or make it worse or better in, uh, on the trucking side and the railway side? Um, how does that intersect, Jason? Why don't you chime in? Yeah, so what happens is especially take these long distance movements from, let's say, Southern California to Chicago for imports. Normally, a big chunk of that's going to move by rail. As you can't move as much by rail, that's going to fall over to the truckload side and specifically what we call the spot market, because these are unplanned shipments or they're going to be shipments in excess of typical contractual volumes. The challenge is that's a three or four day trip, Los Angeles to Chicago, and then you got to get the truck back. And what that means is that that load, while the outbound load is very attractive, Getting back to Southern California is actually not that easy in doing it loaded um, because there's so much outbound traffic from California. There's a lot more outbound than inbound. And because of that carrier's price going into Southern California, super cheap because you know you can get out. And so what happens is, is you have, let's say, 10, 15 percent more volume on this lane. But this is a hyper specialized lane. And that it's a three or four day trip. And then you have to have the knowledge to get back and do it fully loaded to make any money. The challenge is, is most trucking ca capacity in this country is regionalized very heavily. You'll have carriers that run Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Illinois. They're not going to go out to California. There's no way they're, they can po possibly get out there. And so what you do is on these very few specific lanes, you really increase volume. And we don't have, there's not as much flexibility to suddenly get capacity on these lanes. And so what's the only way to do that? The price mechanism, like Nick mentioned. So spot prices get higher and higher and higher. Eventually somebody says, okay, it's worth my effort to start doing this. But then that starts spilling over to all the other markets because these prices are all correlated, which then starts translating into contract prices starting to go higher and higher and higher which is why we're now looking at year-over-year -year price increases of about a little over 20% in the truckload side, which is an all-time record. So, Bill, you're working with clients who are facing these kinds of issues. And so what are, what are you seeing in, in, uh, from their end? Well, I'm seeing really delayed, delayed lead times, you know, not getting the right components in. So I, re I read an article where one of the ATV manufacturers was not running to a production schedule they're running to. I have this many parts, I can build this machine. So I think people are changing their schedule, changing their demand patterns. And I, I, I hope we don't see the bullwhip, but I, I'm afraid we will. So what would the bullwhip look like? Well, at people, people, if they if they believe there's been a shortage, then all of a sudden they continue to order and order and order, and then the inventory uh, slow down. So if we, I think, if we have something like an interest rate hike or or something that might slow down the the ordering pattern, but people are going to continue to order. They've been short, they've been out, and they order. Nick, what do you think? Yeah, I, I particularly see that happening in the the automotive market, which has had the big problem with the chip shortages. You know, there've been a lot of uh, components that move by rail that have not been moving and are, are built up 
now trying to get to uh, the, the, the motor plants. Um, we also see that there are a lot of cars sitting parked, waiting for chips and other parts to be fitted to them. So that's increasing the actual cost for the automakers, reducing their profits, but ultimately will lead to higher pricing. And I, I think the whole, what I notice is that we, we're seeing inflation fueled by the reactions that people have made to the pandemic. Some of it is because they didn't have the space, therefore they've had to rent space to hold inventory. Some of it is due to the fact that transportation costs have gone up. Some of it is due to the fact that raw material prices have gone up as well because the, manuf- the producers of raw materials haven't been able to guarantee their supply into the supply chain. So it's, um, it's a, a bit of a difficulty. Um, we're facing, I think, a, a global inflationary situation. And uh, we've got to be, we're looking, got to look to government to be strong and to actually get on top of the situation. What I, what I fear is that addressing the symptoms may not be the right way to go. I think we've got to get to the root cause. And uh, I think part of the root cause is the fact that we look at supply chains in too many totally separate segments rather than looking at it as a integral movement from raw material production right through the customer experience because uh, that way we can actually see where the real issues lie focus on those rather than just saying for example we need to get the ports working 24 hours a day so bill does this this kind of uh sounds like you're preaching about map your supply chain really see how your supply chain is make sure you have transparency in your supply chain. And uh, in the course of doing that, you might find how yours intersects with other supply chains. Well, I think I think one of the things that's kind of interesting is I think there's been a shift in, in thinking about your supply chain. I think for the 90s, we went outsourcing, chasing low-cost labor. Then we had a, uh, floods in Thailand, an earthquake, and then we had tariff wars. And I think now people are trying to figure out where should I be? Should I be in uh, close to the markets I serve in smaller footprint plants? Should I bring them in, uh, bring and reshore things? So I think that those, those are some of the dynamics I don't think are helping. Uh, what do you think, Jason? Well, I'll admit, I think that the discussion of, you know, reshoring, I think there's been a lot of hype, but I'm not seeing any evidence yet of that in, in the data. Um, when you look at a lot of what we offshored, really in the early 2000s, um, we either offshored it or automated it. The jobs aren't coming back. I mean, that, that's one thing to be clear is anyone who thinks we're going to go back to 1990s level manufacturing employment, it ain't ever going to happen. I think that there will be some discussion about sole sourcing from a single country. So do I have multiple suppliers only in China? I think that that will be more open for for debate and discussion. Um, And I think, so I think that there will be more emphasis on that front. I think from a resiliency side at the end of the day, I just don't see how companies are going to incur known costs with an unknown benefit because this is the challenge. You're already seeing some firms say once COVID's over, this idea of just in case inventory, we're not doing it. And so I, I think the challenge is, is inherently the financial pressure is to be as lean as you can be um, just because you're avoiding known costs. And that is just so, so high in the minds of decision makers. And so I think that's going to be the challenge for supply chain practitioners is explaining to folks in finance, this is the real option value of doing X, Y, and Z. You know, this is why we're producing in Mexico and not... Indonesia is going to be selling the value of, look, we don't have the ocean transit piece in this. When somebody says, but it's 35% cheaper labor costs in Indonesia, that's going to be, I think, the challenge moving forward. So we may not learn any lessons from this experience in some respects, in terms of shortages and disruptions. No, so I, I think to me, the historical episode I'm looking at to draw a lot of parallels is not the 70s. I think we've picked a wrong episode, especially the inflation side. It's really 1946 through 1948, because when World War II ended, all the price controls get dropped. 
in inflation in 1946 and 1947, it's horrible. It's 20% annual for those two years. Food prices in a single month went up 7% roughly once they dropped the price control. So it was uncontrolled inflation, but it cooled down over time because the demand finally started to slow. And it was the exact parallels. You had pent up demand, record amounts of money, and folks can now spend it again. Same way at the start of the Korean War period, inflation skyrocketed because everybody remembered what happened in World War II. We go to war, the shelves all get empty because everyone stocks up, assuming we're going to go back to World War II style price controls and production controls. And so to me, what I do, what I'm looking at is historically for those comparisons. And what I basically see is this is just a process that is going to take another six to nine months to play out, but it will play itself out. I mean, now we have the uncertainty about Omicron. So that that's the new wild card in this is every time it seems that things are getting better, we've had Delta show up in the second half of 2021. And now we have Omicron showing up basically for the first half of 2022. I, I think there's an interesting aspect to this that um, what we've actually got now is a global problem. Whereas post Second World War, we had country based national problems. You know, I think back to just before I was born in Britain, everybody had a ration book up until the 19, early 1950s. So demand was actually managed by the government on many things. And uh, a lot of people didn't have jobs. Uh, there weren't that many women in the workforce after the war. They, all the jobs went back to the guys, but a lot of the guys didn't come back from the war. So there was a labor shortage, therefore production was down, and there wasn't a lot of availability. Even if people wanted to spend the money, they couldn't. Um, so I think we're in a very different situation now. You know, we've had a lot of years of great affluence, and to be suddenly finding that we can't get what we want exactly when we want it, is a bit of a shock to everybody. And that's caused a big knee-jerk reaction. Um, how we actually get over that remains to be seen. But we all thought we were going to be without toilet tissue as COVID continued. But the stock got back into the stores. And I, I, you know, every time I go in the store now, I look. And yes, it's not as full as it used to be, but there is still there some there if you need it. Um, and I think that's true of, of most things. I was once listening to someone from Homeland Security, and they said the biggest mistake that we've ever made in the U.S. was to take out rail capacity and turn them into running tracks. Um, you know, do you, do you see uh, reinvestment in infrastructure that's going to bring rail back to uh, a state where we'll be able to survive better? So that's a great question, Bill. Um, at the moment, the railroad companies because they are vertically integrated, they have to fund the good repair maintenance of the railway tracks, the bridges, the tunnels themselves, whereas our highway system is looked after from various government funding. Um, but the railways reinvest between 15 and 20% of their revenue in maintaining that state of good repair. Compare that to something like the chemical industry, they only spend about 6% of their revenue maintaining their refineries and other things. So the railway actually does put a lot of money back into it. Um, yes, they'd really like it if the government were to say, here's a handout for uh, the railroads in, respect, in response to what good work they've done keeping the country moving um, over the last 18 months. But there's a fear within the railway companies that they might have to face extra regulation if they accept government money. So at the moment, um, it's a, a careful game that's being played. Um, there's a lot of balancing going on. Um, the Surface Transportation Board are looking at the railway industry quite closely at the moment, um, looking at accessorial charges such as demurrage, uh, looking at... Um, switching arrangements, reciprocal switching arrangements, and trying to see how they can actually exert a little bit of economic pressure without regulation, because they don't want to regulate either. It's worked really well in the free market over the years and will continue to do so. Um, we've seen probably the last of the mergers with Canadian Pacific merging with Kansas City Southern. 
I don't think we'll see any mergers between the, what will now be six class one railroads that cover North America um, because that will take away competition. So uh, I think that if there has been anything, it was an application of precision scheduled railroading, which in every other industry is called lean management, uh, in such a way that we took out assets that we didn't feel were paying their way. We reduced locomotives, we reduced staff, we took out sidings, um, took out passing loops. Now, particularly the two railroads in Canada, finding that they've got to reinstate some of those. They've got to make them longer because the trains are longer, because it's more efficient to run a longer train with just one crew than it is to run, run two short trains with separate crews. Um, so they are feeling the pinch a little bit, but they're in charge of their own future. Uh, I'd like to see them do a little bit more about growth. And we've seen some, some growth aspects. Uh, Canadian National recently set up a transload operation in Chicago to do a, a less than container load return traffic to the West Coast ports, which I thought was a, a very interesting move. Um, that sort of meets some of the trucking issues that Jason spoke about earlier. Um, it gives a, a way to make some money for the railroads on return containers to the, to the ports. So, Nick? Some final thoughts. What are, what's the takeaway here? Um, we were we were hit hard by COVID because we'd got into a situation where our supply chains were so finely tuned and had years of past experience um, being supported by mathematical models that said this is what you need to order. And then when suddenly we hit a big change in what consumption is going to be those models take a long time to alter direction. Excellent. Jason, a final thought or two? What's our takeaway? Hang you tight, know, it I, sounds like. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that is, it's just hang tight. These situations will work themselves out. We're in, you know, we are in a unique time period that we've not, you know, encountered this type of demand shock combined with, you know, supply, supply disruption. Um, and, and it's hit at a perfect time. We've got a commodity price surge and agriculture and oil and fertilizers and all these different products. And so the one thing I would say too, is everybody needs to stop blaming the transportation sector for inflation. It's a very small percentage of the overall spend. I just finished calculating for food, 3% of the value of food Food, pro food production is tied into truck transportation. So the reason food is six or 7% more expensive is not due to trucking prices. It's due to commodity inflation. And so that's the other thing too, and this ties into that policy discussion. If you wanna fight inflation, you have to identify what are the sources. Right now, there's no evidence that it's transportation costs, and there's no evidence that it's retailers gouging for price gouging prices, at least for when it comes to food. There's no evidence of that. Instead, it's just we have more expensive commodities due to commodity prices going up and that cascading through the supply chain. That takes a while to work itself out. And so there's no quick solution to getting those ships in Los Angeles and Long Beach unloaded. There's no quick solution to getting inflationary pressures under control. It just takes time. We experimented with price controls in the 70s. It was an absolute failure. And so there's no thought of going to something like that. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. Bill, a final uh, thought? I, what do you make of all this? I, I think that people with, who are uh, in the supply chain have to think about flexibility and agility. And I do think that you know um, managing and working really closely in supplier relationships will help you through the, through the problem. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. This has been a very interesting, certainly some very interesting perspectives, uh, a good reality check for supply managers. I'm Bob Rosbeck. This has been Global Sourcing Insights from SIPS. Thank you and have a great day.